Yeah. I'm not sure they will. Yeah. Oh, the problem. Okay. Okay. We'll try again. How about now? Just echo. Oh, so we left. So it works. All right. Yeah, so it works. Right, so if if, if if the the audience cannot hear what we say, please let us know. Uh, uh, hopefully now hopefully it's now it's working. All right. All right. Yeah. So uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. So thanks, uh, Adrian and uh, Adrian for having me here and organize this organizing this uh, visit and this event. Yeah. So today I'll be talking about some uh, different ways of uh, using projective measurement and uh, some unitary feedback. And that allows us to engineer many interesting quantum order and quantum criticality that we care about in a very efficient way in particular. So this talk is based on the uh, these two papers and um, which are done in collaboration with uh, which involve collaboration with a bunch of amazing, amazing people, including Zerha and Sanga from Santa Barbara, uh, Isaac Kim from UC Davis, and Leo and Tim from Perimeter Institute. Right. So let me say the stage by saying that in the study of quantum matter, we care about some collective behavior of, of a large number of quantum particles. And quite often, because of interaction among these quantum particles, we see many interesting examples of the emergent order. For example, we have this uh, fraction of quantum whole states, superconductivity, and some quantum crit criticality that occurs at a quantum phase transition. And that carries some interesting uh, quantum correlation. We may want to explore more. So this is a traditional scope for studying quantum matter. On the other hand, recently, we see many rapid progress on different quantum devices. For example, in this uh, trap ion quantum computer and uh, this uh, superconducting qubit. So these are quantum platform where you could imagine you have a bunch of qubits you can use, and there are some unitary gates you can apply, and there are some mid-circuit measurement. You can, you can do the measurement in the process of uh, some of the evolution in the circuit. Yeah, so those are ingredients available in, uh, nowadays. And that really motivates the question, can we artificially engineer some interesting states of matter on these platforms, in particular in a very efficient way? And this question might be important because there are many cases where it may be challenging to find some interesting physics in materials, right? So right now in this uh, quantum platform, it really opens up an opportunity to, to explore some interesting many body physics uh, in these quantum platforms, right? You can build, you want to build up some interesting states of matter by sequentially applying some local unitary gain and measurements, and that provides you some handle to study many body physics. And in particular, for the interesting states, I will consider typically those are the so-called long range entangled states of matter, including the example of some topology order, which is the underlying order of a many quantum spin liquids. And the second example is the quantum critical states that occurs at quantum phase transitions. So those are different, very, very different from the trivial product states. And those are, they carry some interesting physics uh, we care about. And a common feature is that this, almost by definition, this uh, long range entangled states of matter require a time that scale with the system size in order to prepare using any local unitary dynamics. For example, if you start from initially, you prepare some initial product state at time zero, initialize in some product state beside zero. You may imagine you want to build up some interesting state of matter at a long time by sequentially applying some local unitary gates, right? That is a local unitary circuit. But it turns out it takes a very long time to prepare some interesting long range order. The intuition just, uh, just because in this uh, local unitary dynamics, there's a light comb, right? There's a maximum speed at which you can propagate the correlations. So that means if you want to create some long range order with the length scale, if you want to create the long range correlation between two points in the space with the length scale with the system size, you necessarily need to wait a long time to prepare, right? In any local unitary dynamics. That is pretty bad because if you take such a long time to prepare the interesting state of matter, you suffer from the decoherence of the environment. So you almost cannot prepare the state you want in the perfect way, right? So it would be ideal if you can shorten the preparation to when you want to realize this uh, interesting state of matter. So how do we, what is the answer? How, how do we go around this? How do we avoid this issue? So it turns out with uh, local measurements, 
uh, many intuitive state of matter can be realizable in all the one time, for example. So that is a very short time. That is a very short time. So that gives you a very efficient way to realize uh, intuitive state of matter. In particular, the idea being when you do the local measurement, that is a non-unitary process. So that's why you can avoid this uh, fundamental restriction of a uh, local unitary circuit, right? That is a, that is a non-unitary process, so it can do something very violent that can efficiently realize some intuitive order in a very short time. Yeah, so and feel free to ask questions uh, in my talk. So, yeah, so if you're if you're talking about measurement of a non-unitary process, right? I guess with measurement, you can always uh, view it as a unitary process acting on a large number of scales. Um, by by. Oh, the, I think the, the, the thing you are mentioning is about the channel, right? You could. Well, I'm saying any mm -hmm. measurement can be. There's, there's always a unitary picture of measurement if you expand the public space. Um, mm -hmm. you know, like, sign dilation. Mm -hmm. so, like, mm -hmm. How should I understand in that picture how you get around the restrictions on unitary? Ah, I see. That's a good question. So in addition to this uh, local management, we're gonna consider some non-local uh, classical communication. So that non-locality will be the key ingredient to realize long-range order. So at least in large picture is not enough. We need some non-local uh, classical communication processing and that will guarantee the long-range order. Yeah, and that is an important, important ingredient. Uh, I will be discussing later. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah. yeah. So this is the online of this talk. So in, in this uh, talk, I was discussing how do we can apply this uh, local unitaries, uh, local measurements, and the non-local uh, classical communication. With these three ingredients, we can efficiently realize uh, many interesting order and good quality in a very short time. So in the first part, I'll be focusing on circuits. That means that you're gonna start on some pure state. You end up with some pure state. We may have some interesting orders. In the second part, I'm going to consider some more general uh, vertical and that gives you some quantum channel. That means if you start from some pure state, you're going to end up with some mixed state, which may have some interesting order. Yeah. All right, so let me dive into the first part. That is the local adaptive circuits. So then this is the basic ideas. You start from some physical spin chains, right? You are allowed to answer answer loss, and then in the first layer of the structure, you could imagine you apply some this extensive uh, local unitary gates in the first layer, this um, uh, blue box. And then in the second layer, you could imagine you do some local measurements. It is like you can do some single size measurement or some two size measurements that you can act extensively across the entire systems in some pattern. And after this uh, measurement layers, of course, when you do a measurement, you cannot control the measurement outcome, right? So you're gonna get some measurement outcome you can record the outcome of some classical data in the next layer when you apply the local unitary. The choice of a local unitary will depend on the previous measurement outcome you already recorded as a data. And importantly, when you apply the local unitary here, you require the non-local communication because the choice of this unitary will depend on the global measurement outcome. And in that step, you really require the non-local uh, communication, yeah. So it turns out with this uh, hybrid structure of the unitary and the measurements, you can realize many interesting target state in a very short time. And in particular, um, the idea being the preparation of the target state is deterministic in the sense that even though when you do the measurement, you get different outcome, but then for a given outcome, you can always find some appropriate unitary to carry the outcome. So that you can deterministically converge to the state you want to realize, say some intuitive state with some long range order states of matter. Yeah. So this is a deterministic process in the end. Yeah. And uh, indeed, uh, this kind of hybrid adaptive circuits, oh, by the way, this adaptive means that the, local cho the choice of a local unitary is adapted to the previous measurement outcome. So that, is, that justifies this uh, local adaptive circuit. And uh, indeed, uh, our work is not the first to discuss this uh, adaptive circuit. For example, they have in the field works discussing the utility of this uh, adaptive circuit. But what's interesting is there are more. There are more interesting ways of uh, thinking about 
how to design these uh, some interesting adaptive circuits using measurement and the unitary feedback. What interesting is there are three different, so in this work, there are three different classes of circuits we uh, introduced, which are inspired by three different physical insights. Lots are familiar with uh, connect with people. So I think those are the interesting parts, which involve these uh, tensor networks, entanglement, renormalization, and the part-time constructions. And that will enable many interesting uh, orders, say in order one time, you can also prepare some chiral, non-abelian orders. Non-abelian means you can hold some for abelian, abelian anions, and chiral means you can have some chiral edge mode. So, and those are the interesting states of matter. If you consider log L time preparation, which is not too bad anyway, L being the system size, so this is not too bad, you can realize more interesting states of matter. You can also engineer quantum criticality in the log L depth using only local operations. And, and those can, it cannot be done with, with um, unitary circuits and in short depth. Yeah, so, this really demonstrates the utility of uh, different ways of uh, thinking about measurements to realize some interesting states of matter in a very short depth. Yeah. So in the following, I'm gonna give you some a very brief summary about the individual protocol. And I hope I hope that should be enough. And then I'll be yeah, I'll be happy to discuss more after the talk. Oh, wait. Yeah. And uh, I want to emphasize that so, so just in the last month, so there are two papers uh, done with uh, continuums where they have this uh, trap ion quantum computer and uh, it has been demonstrated that this adaptive protocol has some advantage compared to the unitary circuit. And then we involve in one of the world here. Yeah. So this is uh, just on the emphasize that this is a real thing that can happen right now. So it's not like uh, something superficial. So it's a kind of realistic uh, setting we can do in the lab. Yeah. But I don't want to go into the details about this uh, realization. Right. So let me dive into the first part that is inspired by the tensor networks. And for that, I think I want to give you some sh very short review about what kind of states we want to realize. So the simplest example of is given by this uh, uh, two D Turi code introduced by Kitaya, and that holds some interesting order um, on the lattice. And to define the state, let's consider consider some you have some square lattice, and on every link of the lattice you have a qubit. And what is the state we consider? You can consider a ground state of a 2 d code that is a sum of a loops, where a loops means it is a product state configuration of a spin. Say, for example, this is a loop where I draw a loop here in the blue line. So that means this is a product state configuration where every spin on the loop is pointing down, otherwise it is pointing up. So this is a product state, and this is another product state. This is another product state. And you are gonna superpose all the possible loop configuration for spins, and that's give you this 2D total ground state. And it is a non-trivial state. It cannot be prepared easily from a product state using unitary dynamics. Yeah. It's, and in other words, it's also in this uh, topological non-trivial basis of matter in a different phase away from this uh, trivial state. Right. All right, so right now I'm gonna give you a protocol to show you how you can efficiently realize the state I just mentioned. So the idea being you prepare some small building block. So you could imagine you consider a state of four spins, right? And then you're gonna consider the wave function such that say alpha, beta, gamma, delta, they are the spin basis in the poly Z. So they take one or minus one, you know, and spin out, spin down. You're gonna construct the states such that the wave function is equal to one if the product of this spin basis is equal to one. That means that you're gonna consider a wave function that is equal to one if they are even number of spin down. Yeah. Otherwise, you get zero. And so schematically, the, the, this is the state we construct. It is a sum of uh, zero spin down state, four spin down states. Spin down is represented by a red link, and you can have two spin down states. You can also oppose all these uh, states, right? And that gives you a small building block. And because the small building block only involves all the one number of spins, you can prepare the state easily. You know that? And the idea being, you could imagine you simultaneously prepare many small building blocks. So it is a tensor part of a different vertices states. 
And then you consider the circle like a two body measurement. So let's consider some link. There are two spins belonging to different vertices. You are gonna measure the operator like a Z1 times Z2. You measure this two body operator. So you get uh, one or minus one outcome, right? And that corresponding theory, like you are applying one plus Z over two or one minus Z over two. So it is a projector, right? And then the claim is, if you, you can simultaneously repair this and decouple uh, small building blocks, you simultaneously do this uh, two body easy measurements on everywhere. And then you can, when, if the outcome is equal to one, you can glue different uh, small building blocks together and not form a mini body state. And the claim is, um, if the outcome everywhere is equal to one, and you realize the perfect territorial state we just discussed, so it is Hi, like- Can I ask a question? But you use easy measurements. If the measure outcome is equal to one, then that means that the spin here and the spin here, they take the same value. So they are fused to the single effective qubit. And it turns out that Hello. effective qubit, you can see the torical order states. So this is one way to see that. If you do the extensive uh, two body is easy measurement, you get this kind of pattern, right? And this is the corresponding state you construct. This is the decoupled state you begin with. This is a projectively force. You can convince yourself that it's gonna be a superposition of loops. So this is like a loop, everything's been pointing, pointing down along these loops, and this is a different loop here. Yeah. So this so this gives you a, a handle to realize the Z2 torical order states on matter. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, idea just being that you take some decoupled cluster states and you do the two body ZZ measurement to kind of glue them together and not realize the uh, total order states. Hi, can I ask a question? How should you think about this equation process? It seems uh, it seems potentially quite computationally intensive. Um, so, mm -hmm. Let's say that I have to match, like, say, local junction conditions. That's right. These two things. That's right. Um, it seems in principle that I could encode some MP complete problem into this matching of the junction conditions, because I think I can encode instances of set of, uh, of three set uh, into these sorts of matching conditions. So is there some sort of complexity theoretic constraint on the, on the types of junction conditions that you allow? Uh, right. I think one answer I can ask is, I think there's a question, what is M in the previous slide? Right. <laughs> but let me answer that question real quick. So M is the measurement outcome. So M can be a plus or minus one, that corresponding to the different measurement outcome. So it's like a Z2 value, yeah. Yeah, so let me, here's my question. Mm. Super clear, Jeff, um, so here, um, it is clear that, it's clear to me how you generate the local cluster choices. That That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then, um, you're probably prevented from having all possible combinations of those clusters giving you valid states. And so like your, your constraints on which clusters can plug into which other clusters is like a local constraint. Uh, last constraint is given by the measurement outcome, right? Because before the measurement, they are, they are decoupled. So there's no constraint between neighboring vertices. Right, but isn't that measurement outcome? But your measurement outcome is determined by the Hamiltonian. Oh, the measurement outcome is determined by whatever quantum mechanics tell you. It's a random outcome, so we can, you can get one or minus one. So let me maybe let me finish this. So if you get a measurement outcome, what could be one everywhere, you realize the perfect C2 choice board is a loop, condensate of a loop state. And then the important thing is that you are not guaranteed to get a one outcome one to be everywhere, right? There are some cases where certainly almost likely you get some here, you get a measurement outcome to be minus one here and minus one come to be here, which you don't want. And then in that case, you can find some simple unitary to correct the, the outcome. Um, there's a, a question in the audience, uh, from the online audience. Um, some other, uh, other uh, uh, raised uh, your hand. Can you ask your question? You go time.
All right. Sorry about that. If I miss um, the question, is because we're having some problem here. So please raise your hand. Well, again, I, I can also just ask questions that we can hear, right? We, we can hear it. I, I asked my question in the chat. Thanks. Uh, all right. Um, Are there any other questions? If you go back a couple of slides, uh, there, what is M? All oh, right, yeah, that's um, M is a uh, one or minus one. It, it is the measurement outcome, right? Because you do measure some D to one pressure, so you get some item value which can be one or minus one. Yeah, so just a different measurement outcome. And I'm saying that if the measurement outcome is one everywhere, you realize the same ones. Yeah. And then the, in this uh, slide, I mentioned that, of course, you can not guarantee the outcome is one everywhere. In that case, you can you can convince yourself that outcome minus one can pair. You can just pair up this uh, outcome you, that you don't want by applying some simple answer unitaries to carry the outcome. So that means that for no, no matter what outcome you get, we can always realize the perfect uh, Tory curve that you want. So that is the idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, basically, many interesting topological orders they have some underlying tensor natural representations, and we can utilize that. So, for example, abelian. Yeah, there's some interesting order here. At least, yeah, I don't want to go into details. But all of this has some tensor natural representations, and we can apply the same framework. To prepare this interesting state of matter in order one zap by you know considering some small decoupled building blocks and you use the distant two body measurement to try to glue different uh, building blocks and not form the many body states. Yeah. So that is the summary for the uh, the first protocol. Mm -hmm. All right. So let me just quickly jump to the second protocol, which is inspired by the mirror, that is the so-called. A multi scale entanglement renormalization ensemble introduced by Vadel. Right. So, one highlight is we can use uh, local operations to prepare some quantum critical states and more interesting order states of matter in log LZ. And uh, let me just quickly summarize what is the idea of the MERA. Uh, so, basically, you could imagine on the UV, on the lattice, you have a full many body wave function. And right now, MERA is a way to systematically remove the short distance degrees of freedom. So on every level of hierarchy, you apply some uh, operations so you can disentangle some trivial garbage and not generate RG flow from UV to IR. And not, so that give you a, a recipe to do the RG on the lattice. That is a conventional uh, MERA, just doing the entanglement of RG. On the other hand, if you view this structure from the top to the bottom, that gives you a unitary circuit to prepare the states on the lattice. So you can view MERA as a unitary circuit, but that is non-local because as you can see here, on the higher level of the hierarchy, you require some non-local you know, two-body unitary gate to connect uh, these two spins. So the only difficulty is, although it is a unitary circuit, but it is non-local, right? So how should we efficiently realize this narrow circuit? So it turns out uh, using uh, local measurements and the local unitaries, you can implement the non-local unitary required by the mirror, and, and then that give you a recipe to realize the mirror circuit. And um, the idea relies on this measurement-based interpretation. Imagine you have three particles, and in particle one, that includes unknown states in the wave function alpha and beta, and the task is um, you want to teleport this unknown wave function from particle one to particle three, then how do you do this? The idea is you first prepare a bell pair shear between particle one, so a bell pair shear between particle two and three, that is a bell pair. And then you focus on the qubits one and two, you do the bell pair measurement. That means that when you do the pair pair measurement, you are going to project T to one of the past four pair pairs between one and two. And the claim is you can check by some simple calculations. If the measurement outcome is like up, up plus down, down for the particle one and two, 
you can teleport the information to particle three where the wave function is originally encoded in the particle one. Importantly, for the other measurement outcome, if you project it to different bell pairs, you will know what operator you need to apply on the particle three so that you can correct the error. So no matter what outcome you get, you can always teleport by applying some appropriate unit trace. That is the, so that is the teleportation using measurements, which is kind of familiar with the quantum information community. So right now we kind of generalize this, this idea to the many body setup. Say on the physical speed chain, you have a bunch of physical qubits. You want to apply a unitary that connects it between particle A and B. How do you do this? You could imagine you, have, you have supplement uh, some ancillary spin chain where this uh, they form a bell pair, a bell pair, bell pair, bell pair. And then what you do is you do this kind of pattern of the bell pairwise uh, bell pair measurement. You measure bell pair measurement here, 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 here. It turns out using this uh, pattern of a uh, bell pair measurement, you can teleport a spin from A to the B part, which is the neighbor of B. And then you can just apply the local unit you want to apply. Then you can teleport it back by, by, by doing the pairwise uh, bell pair measurement again. So it's just an idea, idea is very simple. You teleport, it, you teleport two distant spins to the neighboring sites, you do the local measure, local unitary gate, and you teleport it back to the genome of the curve. And this ends up being changed like a, like a channel where you can teleport information. Yeah, so that is the idea. And you can imagine you can do this on every layer of level of the mirror circuits. So you can realize mirror circuits using only local operations, like a local measurement and the local unitaries. So why do you need to do multiple measurements? That's right, because um, I want to teleport A from I teleport A to B prime. And this you need to do this, this pairwise measurement so that you can teleport this guy to here. But if you have a CFP state, yeah, uh -huh. then they you know, say it has like 100 lattice sites. Mm -hmm. Then there exists entanglement between lattice site one and lattice site three. Right. Um, and the null cell partition protocol just requires existing entanglement. And then you don't have to simultaneously measure uh, the A site and the B site in any sense. So I don't understand why you need to use. I don't understand why you need to use teleportation as a hopping term, basically. Mm. I don't understand why you can't just take two sites and then do the normal teleportation. Normal teleportation, but that would require being non local, right? Um, I don't think so. Because, like, normally how teleportation works is that A and B share some bell pair. So mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's right. But then you need to begin with some bell pair share between A and B. Some perfect bell pair share between A and B so that I can do some local thing. You can teleport from here to here. But then you can imagine some stuff on some physical spin chain. You don't have a perfect bell pair that connects between two points. But then why do you think that there is a perfect bell pair that connects even two places? Oh, yeah. So it is like you have a bunch of bell pair connecting between here. So you can imagine when you do these uh, local measurements, it is like you created a long bell pair. Uh, share between here and here. Yeah, well, of so course, but I'm, I'm trying to understand like why it is valid to say that why, why it's always true that adjacent sites on a spin chain have bell pair. Oh, it's not always true. It is by design. You design the incident spin chain such that it is consistent by perfect bell pairs. Yeah. I mean, I guess I'm still a little bit confused, mm. right? And we can move on because mm. this is the context. But, but like, uh, I can understand why you want your circuit on the physical spin chain to be a Um, But your ancilla spin chain, I don't understand why there's any sense in which you need to apply local in, 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 in which you need it to be local, right? So I could design my ancilla spin chain by construction, my B prime spin chain, such that there's a bell pair's worth of entanglement between the one that's on top of A and the one that's on top of B. And then just do one measurement for me. Oh yeah, that, that's right. You can do that. But then you could imagine, why do you have this non-local bell pair to begin with? 
Well, that is said would require some non local. Yeah, that's all I'm saying is that the locality makes sense in the context of the problem. Right. But the ancilla spin chain is something that you treat in some computational basis. So whether or not locality matters in the ancilla and the ancillary spin chain is less clear to me. Oh, I, I see what you mean. Yeah, so indeed, if you have a paper bell pairs, say initially connecting A and B prime, then indeed you are right. You can just do the one shot bell pair measurement to turn it forward. But then I think I think the setup we are considering is that everything is the local. Then slot spin is like a physical thing you prepare in the in the experimental setup. So then you can only do local operation to even for this n slot spin chain. So then you can only start from some neighboring uh, bell pairs. You don't have the distance bell pair to begin with, even if you consider n slot spin chain. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying is that the, the preparation of the for the n slot spin chain doesn't have to be done uh, synchronously. With uh, the preparation of the measurement um, with the physical station. So you could just say days in advance, prepare like it entangles. Oh, yeah, that, that, we, that we can do. That, 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 yeah, if you do that, then we can, yeah. Yes. Then, we don't need to, then we don't need to do this. But then that, that requires you start from some non local bell pair to begin with. Then you can, we can do whatever you just mentioned. Sure. Yeah, that's right. Yes, in the answer, I think it doesn't seem like um why not because uh, you don't have to th there's no time limitation in the sense that you need to do it at the same time that you would be or even close to the same time in which you would be doing the measurement you could prepare it like year and, it uh, and then set up set it up as a resource and just pull it out i guess you could do that you could do that but then you need to start with because you need to apply this and non-local unitary gates everywhere on the main raster gates yeah, so I guess you are right. If you you can also imagine there in the background there are many distance bell pairs. You you can start from that. You can then we don't need to do this. Yeah, but then yeah. So it's the I think it's the equivalent equivalent thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could imagine on a resource you you already begin with many non local bell pairs. Then we can we can do the the protocol you just mentioned. Yeah, but but here we imagine everything is stop starting from starting from starting from something, something trivial. Yeah, then we have to build up things uh, using the local operations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is the idea. Just teleport and do local thing and we teleport it back. Yeah. Right. And uh, as we know, as people figure out, uh, many critical states and uh, some gap cross border states, uh, they have the exact mirror constructions. So that means that we can already uh, use in, uh, implement the mirror. So we can use in local operations and we can realize this uh, obviously it's a matter in long of gap. Yeah, because the mirror construction has been worked out uh, by these people, so yeah, we can just implement uh, their 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 architecture. Yeah, yeah. So this is a summary for sure. Summary for the second part for the mirror uh, protocol. So let me go to the uh, the last adaptive protocol that is inspired by the part time constructions. So one highlight is that you can prepare. Some say Cairo, not a video order, and all the one time. So the key idea is that uh, you can use the measurement to implement the part time constraints and not give you a powerful handle to prepare the states you want. And one idea is um, say you focus on the Giza Honeycomb model. Now we're going to focus on this particular model because they have an uh, exact part time construction. Say, in order to divide this uh, Honeycomb model, you could imagine you start from some Honeycomb lattice. And spin one half is the amount of vertices of, the, of this uh, honeycomb lattice. And depending on orientation of these um, links of the honeycomb model, you are going to assign a neighboring access interaction, or YY interaction, or ZT interaction. That is the conventional honeycomb model. And then, although different terms don't commute, so at the first glance, it looks hard to solve for the ground state of a honeycomb model. But then, Kita has a very clever construction that is. You could imagine you fractionalize the spin one half into four Marana patterns. Yeah. So then this is that you have a block like a spin one half, you fractionalize into four fermions, and then you assign some appropriate algebra that connect the physical spin and the Marana fermions. And then importantly, those are fermions, they are not independent. You need to apply the so called popcorn constraints that is the part of this fermion is equal to one. So that you can make it back to the physical subspace of the of the spin one half, and that is kind of easy to see why you need to do this constraint because 
if you have a spin one half, you have two dimensional degrees of freedom, right? The two dimensional Hilbert space. If you have four Marana fermions, it's like two complex fermions. So then you have four dimensional Hilbert space. So there are some redundancy so that you can you apply some constraint so that you can make it back to the physical subspace. And then, so it turns out in this uh, Marana proton construction, you can write down some Hamiltonian, some simple way. You can solve for the ground state of a Hamiltonian. So basically, in terms of these Marana fermions, there are some simple constructions. So you can solve for the ground state in terms of these fermions that is given by this percent zero. And then certainly, it is not physical. You need to apply the projector, the proton constraint, so that you can get the actual physical states of the Hartley-Cohn model, right? So this is the well-known constructions. But right now, you also give you give us a recipe to realize the ground state of a Hartley-Cohn model. Because you could imagine in the lab, you really start from a bunch of free fermions, right? You prepare the free fermions in certain ways. And then right now, when you want to glue, when you form, form the main non-trivial many body state, you just consider some side on the vertices. You do this uh, four body uh, measurements. If you do that everywhere, if the outcome is equal to one, it is that you are exactly implementing a projector. And that gives you whatever ground state of a Hamiltonian, I mean, uh, guitar tell us, right? So that gives you a recipe to uh, realize the ground state of a Hamiltonian model. And in some cases, um, this uh, fermion may form some people say superconductor. In that case, you realize some interesting order um, um, states, states, states of matter, which may have a chiral edge mode. Yeah, so this is the idea. You just do the multi size measurements. You can implement the pattern constraint. And importantly, if the outcome is equal to minus one at some point, we can correct. We can apply some simple unitary to correct the outcome. So you can always deterministically realize the ground state of a Hanikov model, which include who may host the characterizing linear orders. Yeah, so this is the idea. Um, yeah, so this is a summary for the first part. I introduced uh, like a, a, diff, a few ways of uh, thinking about measurements, and that really give you some recipe to realize some interesting states of matter. Uh, you might want to explore and this um uh, yeah yeah so uh, any question at this moment yeah so if not let me go to a second part which focus on the quantum channel so by channel we mean we cannot stop on some pure state we can end up with some mixed state we may have some interesting long range order right i guess the first question is maybe a natural question is why should we bother about mixed state because you know, we focus on ground state of a physical Hamiltonian, those are pure state, they are all good. So why should we care about mixed state? I guess the natural question is there are a few aspects, but one aspect is um, mixed state almost naturally arises from the decoherence due to environment. So any realistic physical system may almost in this uh, mixed state. And indeed, this is a very long recent problem where you start from some non trivial quantum basis of matter, and then you consider some finite depth uh, local noise. And you can ask whether the mixed state is quantum order. That's initially in this quantum basis of matter, whether it is survival or not. So there has been some recent progress about this direction. But then I'm not focusing on this. I will go to the opposite direction. I will show you if you start on some simple pure state, you may be able to prepare easily. How can we engineer some quantum channel not realize some non trivial mixed state order and could it have a? Yeah. So this is about the second part. So one application is, I'm gonna show you, if you start from the so-called uh, symmetry protective topological order basis, the SPT, which has some symmetries, say B2 equals Z2 symmetries. And I'm gonna show you that if you start from any points, any pure state that belong to this uh, same basis of matter, I can always converge this uh, SPT to some mixed state with, with which has some interesting long range order, autopilot order. We can show you that this is a universal property of the phase by utilizing. And uh, certainly, our protocol is inspired by the previous work where uh, in this paper by, by Nate and collaborators, they show you that, okay, they, they know and it's pretty simple to show that if you start on a fixed point, uh, SPT, you can have a finite protocol to prepare the um, uh, long range order states of matter, right? But then, it remains unclear, it remains unsettled that if you start from a non-fixed point SPT, 
whether you get a long range order or not after measurements. So, so that is a conjecture. Although it is certainly very suggesting, and there are some arguments, and it's not precise, so then resort to the numerical evidence, and it seems to be the case. But then in our protocol, in the arduino based approach, you can really assure that it is the universal property of the SPT, so that you can get a long range order in the final exam in this quantum channel approach. Yeah. So let me, in the remaining time, let me focus on the simple example that is the 1D SPT. So basically, you could imagine you have a 1D lattice with this, this, with this, this um, bipartite lattice structures. So you could label A1, B1, A2, B2, A3, B3. So there's A, B sub lattice structures. And uh, there's a Hamiltonian you can write down, which holds some interesting SPT. So the first thing is like a three body interaction term. There's a poly X on the B sub lattice. And then you decorate with the two poly Z on the A sub lattice, uh, which are neighbors, right? And, there, and there's another poly X on the A sub lattices. And then you decorate it with some two poly Z. So they give, they give you a three body interaction and a ground state. People know that it is a non trivial SPTs. And there's a two uh, Z2 symmetries for the Hamiltonian you can check. And in particular, it is different from the trivial product state in the sense that there are some long range uh, string order. So basically, if you consider a bunch of product X in a separation of the A sub lattice, if you consider two poly Z on the boundary of the string, you can get some non zero uh, non managing expression value. So that is the long range string order for these SPTs. And indeed, if you deviate away from the fixed points, for example, you can add any local term that preserve the symmetries. If J is small, you are belonging to the same SPT phase. And then indeed, you, know, you can convince yourself that uh, it's been known that the string order will survive. The C is some non-zero uh, constants, even though you increase the size of the string. So it is this uh, long range string order that characterizes this uh, non trivial SPT phase. It is a property of that phase. And then I'm going to show you that starting with some SPT states with some percent zero that carries some long range of string order, you can have a finite jet protocol to convert the, these are non local operators to the local operators. And then that carries some long range order. The C here is exactly equal to the C here. Yeah. And this can be done in finite jet. And in addition to this, certainly if I give you aperture density matrix, if you have this, uh, if you have this quantity, that guarantee that doesn't guarantee the quantum long range order, right? Even like uh, every spin is pointed up, you can get ZZ to be one everywhere, right? And so this is important. We also have the symmetry condition to, to enforce that the part of X is equal to one in this output state. And it is a combination of these two guaranteed quantum long range order in this next state. In particular, there's a precise sense that it is a non-trivial mixed state. So there's a simple proof that suppose I give you arbitrary density matrix with this two condition, the ZZ to one function is some non-zero value and the part of X is equal to one. I can show you that the precise sense that this density matrix is much non-trivial because it cannot be a mixture of a trivial state. Uh, where each trivial state is like connected to the product state by finite unitaries. So, so this is a precise sense that at least the mixed state must be non-trivial. And uh, because the proof idea is kind of simple and kind of illustrating, so let me just give you a few steps to, to go through the step, right? So this is, can be proved by contradiction. Imagine the next state you start with, it can be written as a mixture of a shorter integral states, or better P is the probability and this is the the pure state. So this is an example. Imagine that mixed states can be written as a mixture of a trivial state. Then what happens? Because you know that for this uh, ensemble, the point of X is equal to one. That must mean that for individual pure states, the point of X is equal to, it, it must be equal to one as well. Otherwise, there's no, otherwise you're, get, you're gonna get something less than one in the mixed state. So it must be true for individual pure states. And this uh, global symmetry means that the single poly Z with this uh, trivial state must be equal to zero. And what happens? Because by definition, we know that what do we mean by a trivial state? 
it means that the connected two point function will decay exponentially with the, with the uh, separation between two points. So this connected two point function will decay exponentially with the separation between two points. On the other hand, you know that single poly Z vanishing, right? So that means that when you consider individual pure states, uh, trivial pure state, the Z Z will decay exponentially with the separation between two points. If that is the case for every pure state in the ensemble, it must be true that the ensemble in the ensemble with respect to, to the row, the Z0 decay exponential with the separation between two points. And that is a contradiction because you know that this the this the ensemble you start with, you have this non-zero Z0 to one function, right? So this must, must be wrong. So the state cannot be a trivial mixture, cannot be a mixture of a trivial state. So it is a combination of these two conditions going to the long range order for this ensemble. Uh, is, there, is the proof kind of clear or? Yeah, so with this, uh, let me show you a two-step protocol to realize this uh, mixed day long range order. So let me start from some uh, one of the lattice with this uh, AB sub lattice structures with some, you know, start from some precise zero, which is the pure SPT. And right now in the first layer of the protocol, for every sub lattice, for every size belonging to this uh, sub lattice A, you do this uh, single size measurements and then you measure only X here, Poly x here, poly x here. Certainly, you get you cannot get different outcome. You are, you are not you cannot specify outcome wise. But then you are gonna report the uh, base measurement outcome. Uh, some classical data you record in some classical classical register, for example. And uh, in the second layer, for each of unitaries, unsigned unitaries, the choice of this will depends on this uh, measurement outcome alpha, right? And then, so basically, basically, this means that with this uh, two-step protocol, you are gonna get an ensemble where the p alpha is the probability corresponding to some particular measurement outcome. And for each outcome, it is like you start from some pure states, you have a projector associated with this low measurement outcome, and there's a unitary feedback depends on uh, alpha, but then this unitary acts on the base of the analysis. So you genetically you realize a mixed state ensemble. And you can also write it that's as a dense matrix. And then this is a, like a mixture of a trivial, so a mixture of a Poisson alpha states. And uh, you can just massage a little bit. So it is like some of a different measurement outcome. And you have the initial states, so which you find a projector and the unitaries. This is something you really realize. All right, so how do we see the long range order? Imagine you want to compute the two points function, uh, Q probably Z on the B sub lattice. And then this is the way to compute. You can use the cyclic property of the trace. So you may convince yourself that it can be massaged into this form where there's an operator sandwiched by unitaries and the projector and the, and the precise initial step alpha. You sum over different alpha. And right now, here's the, here's the crucial step. You are going to choose the unitary on the B sub lattices such that when you transform the poly Z, you are gonna decorate it by the sign, which can be plus or minus one, depending on the measurement outcome between two points. And there's a simple unsigned unitary that can do this, uh, which I'm gonna, yeah, maybe I don't need to discuss the details, but then there's a simple unitary to do the job. They can transform poly Z up to a sign related to the measurement outcome. If that is the case, here's the magic. If you choose a U such as you can decorate this uh, poly Z by a bunch of measurement outcome in between. That means that because of projector, you can promote this uh, classical number to be the operator. So then you recover a bunch of part of X in between these two poly Zs, and then this uh, projector commutes with everything. So you may as well move this guy from here to here. You can sum over projector to get one, and that recover the original street order. Yeah. So that means you can convert the non-trivial string order in the initial state to the truly long range order shared between two points in this uh, output density matrix. So this is like a magic, you can convert different. So it provides you a powerful handle to convert the operators. So you can convert some non-local operators to, to be the local operators and not give it a long range order uh, in the output uh, physical state. Um,
Right. And I want to maybe give you a different perspective. So basically, it is a base or it is just that encode a truly quantum long range order. And importantly, the output state, this uh, mixed state can be purified as a pure state beside where there's a unitary that connects between the initial state and the final and this purification state. Why do we care about that? Because that gives you a way to understand the structure of the output mix that you get. Here's a demonstration. You may imagine beside zero is the initial state, and then you turn some coupling in the Hamiltonian, so then you, you can drive a phase transition between SPT and some symmetrical order base. And then, as we just discussed, you can have a measurement and feedback protocol to realize a mixed state on the base of lattices. SPT can be converged to the symmetric open order. And therefore, yeah, that's right. And then this mixed state can be understood as a subsystem of a ground state of a Hamiltonian, which you can derive because there's a unitary that connects it between this uh, precise zero and the precise state. So you know that the output state that carries the long range order is something, it's not something random. It is a subsystem of a ground state Hamiltonian where the Hamiltonian can derive. There's a duality that map between the local terms for the edge naught and this uh, edge. So that gives you a handle to understand the structure of the output state. Yeah, and in particular, as you can see here, when you turn some initial, when you turn the parameter for the initial state, you can, it turns out, if you consider the output physical state, you can see some interesting transition, which happened for the mixed state. For example, there are some algebraic decays for the operators, and this, and this uh, mixed state row, it can be understood, uh, understood as uh, you consider some decoupled uh, critical Hessian chain coupled by some finite unitaries. So there are some interesting structure that occurs on this output physical mixed state. And, um, and for this, to, under, to better understand the structure of this uh, output physical state, you may imagine you can divide the subordinate into two parts with the size x and size l minus x. You may study the entanglement structure between the two regions because it is a mixed state. So you need to use some measure for entanglements, for example, entanglement negativity. Then you can find some scaling nice scaling form with us in the conventional couple of field theories where x is the, is the size of the subregion. So there are some long distance uh, entanglements as in the conventional pure state conformal field theories encoded in this uh, mixed state. But then you can see that the coefficient is kind of small compared to CFT. So, so that requires some explanation and uh, it's an ongoing process where we want to understand better about how to determine this alpha. Yeah, but, but anyway, it is a way to see the long distance entanglements for this uh, mixed state. So it is an interesting way of uh, engineer uh, some interesting mixed state phase transition and criticality. Yeah, and uh, let me just say, use uh, one slide to mention the generalization. Certainly, you can generalize the SPT to high dimension and different groups. So for example, if you have a high dimension SPT, you can get a uh, mixed state not too much order. But uh, let me maybe skip this. So in the final slides, uh, let me say a few words about uh, we can draw at least protocol to the fermions using measurement of feedback. So the question includes if you, you could imagine yourself from something in 1D, there are some a bunch of free fermions that carry some spin, so it's a free spin for a fermion system. So, and then it's a people who know that, okay, if we consider the two point spin spin corners function, we get some algebraic decay with the exponent two. And then our application is that we can have a finite depth protocol, the two depth, a depth two protocol actually. You can, you can modify the long distance criticality. So, so, for example, you can change the exponent from two to one. So, it is a pop handle to modify the nature of the long distance criticality. And the second application is more striking. So in case you are familiar with uh, this uh, chain insulator state, it is like a gap state of matter that is trivial in the bulk and that carries some long range, you know, like a carry edge more on the boundaries. If you start on some gap state of matter, you can have a depth two protocol to engineer quantum criticality in the sense that in the bulk, you are gonna find some interesting algebraic decay, right? So this is an interesting application where 
you can really engineer quantum quick clarity from a gap state of matter. So that is an interesting protocol. And um, maybe just a, a few minutes. So what is the idea for converting this and chain insulating state to the critical states of matter? So the idea being, you know, if you consider some chain insulating states, so people know that there's some off-diagonal long-range order for this kind of uh, states of matter. So basically, you could imagine C is the conventional fermions in the, in the block. If you consider, because it is a gap state of matter, if you consider two point function for C, it cannot decay exponentially. But the trivial thing is, if you supplement the C dagger with some non local operators, where this N depends on the occupation number everywhere, if you supplement, if you address this um, fermion creation operator by these non local operators, it is like attaching a flux, and then you can get some dress operator C delta. It turns out in this C delta operator, there are some algebraic decay. Um, and that is and that occur for this chain uh, insulating state. And the idea being you and for example, you may start from two copies of the chain insulating state. So spin up fermions, they occupy in the chain number one and then and spin up fermion, they are in the C plus minus one uh, chain is it's a, it's a chain insulating states. So then because it is a spin for system, you can define some spin. And you can define some appropriate non-local operators. And then you can see some, if you you can see some, okay, you define some spin operators, and if you dress by some non-local operators here and then here, you're gonna see some um, long-range critical order. But then this is not a truly long-range order because you need to you need to decorate these local operators by some non-local operators, right? So it, this is not a faithful uh, two-point order. But then the idea being. You can have a zap through protocol so that you can convert the two point function to so that you can get a mixed state when you evaluate it within this uh, two point spin spin function. You get a uh, algebraic decay in the final output state. And there are some finite protocols. So basically, the idea is just that you measure, you first measure on the side of the fermion number. And this doesn't trivialize the state because if you consider the measurement outcome to be one, say, okay, the, the size here. There's a single fermion number, but then that is not a trivial state because there's a two four degeneracy. It could be spin out, spin down. So they carry some non trivial degrees of freedom for, for the spin center, right? So if you do the measurements on fermion number, you add this projector, and then you apply some follow up unitary to modify the spin. So this is the mix that you realize, and then you're gonna choose the unitary such that when you transform the spin operator, it is like you are recovering the original low range. And down local operators. So then this gives you a handle to realize the long range order encoding the spin spin college function, and that is that can release an algebraic decay. Yeah, so again, the idea just being that you can transform the non local operators to be the local operators, and this local operator carries some truly uh, long range critical order. Yeah, that is the idea. So, yeah, this is the summary. So, this uh, entire talk is about. How do we use some measurements and unitary feedback in an interesting way so that you can prepare many interesting order states of, uh, with some yeah, many interesting states of matter? The first part focuses on pure states, second part focuses on some interesting mixed state order and liquidity clarity. Yeah, and um, there are many questions, like uh, many detailed questions, uh, but I think the most important question is what are the non trivial order that can be realized in this way? And that is also related to the second question. What are the fundamental limitations of this uh, hybrid protocol with the measurement and feedback? Because there are some inter instances where we don't know how to efficiently realize the interesting order. But then in those cases, we are not sure whether it is because we are too stupid or there are some fundamental reasons that prevent us to realize the, this order. So I think this is an interesting question, but uh, it's kind of open ended right now. And then another question is we, we see some example of a uh, Mixed state which carries some interesting quantum critic, critical correlation. What are the, how should we understand the entanglement structure for those uh, in, instances? Yeah, so those are the broad questions we are thinking, we have been thinking about right, uh, right now. Yeah, so with this, um, let me stop here and uh, we can discuss more later.
Okay, thanks for that nice talk. And are there any questions or questions on the Zoom panel? So raise your hand on the back question. Someone from the online audience uh, any questions? Actually, I have a question. <laughs> Actually, I have a question. So for uh, measurement, uh, Induce uh, some interesting mix shape. Like uh, the first particle, it seems to be pretty clear and universal. If I have an SPT state and make measurement on one of the symmetry, then I get a symmetry breaking state. Or if I have a higher form SPT state, I measure one of the symmetry, I get higher form symmetry breaking, which is more like large order. So for a second particle, where we measure something like the Chen insulator or something like that, and for if we make measurement to induce uh, uh, mixed state which has a polar correlation function, I wonder how universal it is. Uh, especially once you make up and make a measurement, you get a polar correlation functions. Mm -hmm. And is the exponent universal or is the exponent related to some some type of uh, some factors like uh, related with the chain number of the system versus uh, related with some type of specific measurement after you impose it? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. So. I, th I think the understanding is uh, especially this guy in, in, in the paper with uh, Xin Chen Ru. So I think this alpha is not universal. Mm -hmm. So it depends on many details about this. Uh, how do you construct this uh, chain insulin states? So, yeah, so the short answer is alpha is not universal. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's maybe also related to, to the fact that, uh, yeah. So right now we didn't get much understanding about what kind of mixtape we actually realized. We just know that there are some critical collision show up in these uh, spin operators. But then we don't have a very good handle to understand what are the structure of this mix that we actually realize. And so, yeah, so that is an open question we're thinking about right now. And maybe a different, a different reality insight is some. Um, so basically the key idea is like, when you do the fine depth protocol, you can actually provide this, uh, you can actually provide these uh, non-local operators. Mm -hmm. And this is like a bosonization. Yeah, because you do the transportation, so you can you can map a fermion to a boson. So this protocol can be understood as a way to bosonize the spin, uh, bosonize the fermion. So that you can get some spin sectors that carry some interesting correlation, and those are the boson particles. So the second protocol can be, can be understood as a way to bosonize the, the fermion uh, system. And we are thinking about more about what kind of system we can bosonize, and that can give you some interesting state on that. Uh, but uh, I think we don't have a much understanding about what kind of mixtape you actually realize. Yeah. Mm. question about uh, the mm. So like, uh, I don't know, my understanding of the Robinson is that like, there's some finite obligation to uh, some sort of local dynamics to put into uh, the That's right. And so, I'm not quite sure how to square that with the fact that if you're claiming that you can engineer not previously existing long range entanglement. That's right. From uh, local operations. From, from a constant depth local, instead of local operation. Mm. Because I might have thought that like a good mental model for Z2, tensor Z2, SVT phases where everything's short range entanglement right tensor product of a like a two site thing uh -huh. uh -huh. but then the output that you get at the end is something where you have long range order on the on the scale of your system that's right that's right and so why is it that you can achieve this in a constant depth this is like you're needing some sort of mm. some sort of scaling of your circuit that this is that's a very good question so i guess the ingredient is just because you have when you discuss the Lee Robinson bound, it is a bound for this um, local unitary dynamics. And our protocol is the evolved as a non unitary project measurements. And um, right, so I guess this relates again to like this is the first question that I have, which is you can always understand these local non unitary dynamics. Mm, that's right. So, a um, more answer that you have together. Mm, that's right. That's a good point. So, in addition to these uh, non-local, so in addition to these uh, project measurements, a more crucial ingredient is uh, you allow the non-local communication, so that the choice of a local unitary will depends on all the entire global measurement. 
and that requires a non-local communication. So it not violate the reproduction belt for the local operations. I think that is the that answer your questions. Hmm. So there's no limitation. The limitation will be the classical communication speed. Yeah, that's right. Hmm. Yeah, the other question is about more about the stability of your outcome based on measurement like if i make a z measurement then i will get some uh, allowing the order state but suppose when i make a measurement i make a, a small arrow or i slightly to the uh, direction of the measurement like it's just a, a small angle uh, compared to the z directions mm. and it turns out if you just have a small arrow then the uh, final outcome state would not be anything interesting at least there's no large entanglement i remember for the 1D, it's uh, mm. studied by the UC Santa Barbara. Right. Yeah, I wonder for other examples like the higher form uh, SPT state or your trend insulator versus the critical state, uh, are they immune to any error in your measurement? Mm, that's a good question. At least for the chain, chain insulin state, we don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the Z2 cross Z2 SPT in higher dimension, um, I think also in this, uh, the group you mentioned also in this uh, NES and collaborators in the harbor. So the understanding is if you consider SPT in 2D, if you rotate the measure angle, the long range order just goes away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then if you consider SPT in 3D and higher, mm -hmm. then long range order can survive the ensemble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So indeed, that's the stability of all, all these protocols is, uh, is a pretty open question right now. Yeah, but I think it's more about along this. Nine. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. Any questions? Oh, yeah, I guess it does. Chat. Chat. Probably no. Okay, no question. Okay. Then let's yeah. thank the speaker again. <laughs> it's, it's just.